Well, again, everybody, and welcome to the daily edition of the Trick Podcast of Joy and this beautiful Wednesday. How are you guys? Here with my ghost of bell. My ghost of mug is just right there. I already had my coffee, I must say. It was awesome. But today I want to talk to you about the balance between manned justice or man-made justice and God's justice. <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You know those situations where you feel that you need to take matters into your own hands? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Man, my ghost of bell right there. And yet the balance or maybe even the, the wisdom of waiting for God's justice. Here's the, the bottom line. In ev- everywhere in scripture and really everywhere in real life, it is better to wait for the justice of God versus taking matters into your own hands, seeking your own justice. I think even though it doesn't feel as good or as tasty or maybe for those of us who are more combative or who maybe even have had success at being the the judge, juror, and executioner in other people's lives, we struggle. I know it's a struggle for me to wait upon God's justice. And yet, over and over again, everywhere in the Bible, I can't find many verses where God says, yeah, go ahead, do it your way, and, and, and it'll be awesome. And it's the opposite. Everywhere in the Bible, and again, as I said, in real life, anytime that we do things our way, it just, it goes to hell, right? But when we wait for God's justice, realizing that the battle belongs to the Lord, then things just turn out amazing. And so, I, and I talk about this because I have been, I would say, huh, maybe the last few years in a place where I have to constantly wait upon God, wait on God to see all of my dreams come true. And my guess is that you are also have projects or things in your family or maybe uh, your dreams, you have similar things and you don't know the balance. And I don't think there is a balance, but you don't know which way to go. Do I wait upon God? And what does that mean tomorrow, this week? Should I move? Should I break up with my boyfriend? Should I sell the house? You know, what does that mean, God, to wait on you? And yet knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord. So I have a psalm that I love, Psalm Psalm 40, that I want to read to you and give you a few, maybe some tips along the way that I draw from this psalm, speaking of this idea of how God's justice is always better than man's justice. So Psalm 40 says, the Psalm of David, and let me say a few things before I even read this. You know, David is an interesting character for me Obviously, with my name being David, I've always identified with him as a musician, a man of God, as a psalmist, a a warrior, also a very broken man. So now what I don't always understand about David is how he can constantly say, I'm waiting for you, God, and you're my shepherd, and yet he's a warrior at the same time. I don't mean like he worries about problems, but I mean that he's a fighter. He was a man of, of the sword. And I don't think that was of God. In fact, I mean, you could say, I think it's pretty accurate to say that because he was a violent man, God didn't allow him to build the temple. I mean, you think the temple is worship, right? I mean, what, wow, what, what, a, what a sad thing, right? It was, God said it, because you are, you have blood in your hands, you will not build me a temple. It'll be your son. And so you could say that even though, man, yeah, sometimes we could say, oh, well, come on, David was a warrior and look how much God loved him. Well, it doesn't seem to be that God loved that part of David. I don't think God did. I would go as far to say as, as to say that God despised that part of David. The part of David that God loved was the waiting, the that you are my shepherd, not I am the chief, chief, the commander-in-chief on my wall i have these drawings that maybe i shouldn't have on my wall it's of these native nicaraguan warriors what we call quote indians but you know they're not indians they're natives to the land and i have them up there because i i've identified for my whole life with that warrior mentality but i sometimes wonder if 
the way of the gospel is not the opposite. <laughs> well, <laughs> it obviously is, right? I don't have to think about it, but I guess I need to maybe inherit more of that or take that in or take that more seriously, I guess is what I'm saying. And I wonder if you also are dealing with the same things. I wonder if you also relate to my story. Are you also one who likes to fight and not pray? That's another test for me is how many times do I pray about justice or about things in my life that I'm upset about instead of getting angry or withdrawing, which is the other wonderful gift that I have. I just want to run away. <laughs> and so ask yourself, where are you at with the things that frustrate you? Are you praying? Are you taking matters into your own hands? Are you getting angry? Are you withdrawing? Are you overeating? Are you, what's your technique? Or are you waiting on God and in his justice? So here it is, Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. <laughs> Already, I hate this psalm. <laughs> waited? <laughs> the word waited, waited is the beautiful word kava, you know, which we just love. It's just, it's just one of those perfect words in the Bible, which means to hope, to wait for, to look eagerly for, to lie in wait, to linger. I mean, it sounds like some lazy person that's just waiting for things to happen and fall from heaven, right? Like, I hate that word, kava. To wait sounds like a waste of time. <laughs> but I love how the word wait is actually also the word for look. In other words, he's looking for something. It's an active waiting. It's not a passive, like you're just letting people walk all over you, or you're just being an idiot, or you're just giving into overeating or overspending or whatever. It's looking for, it's like the idea of someone who's waiting for a cloud, meaning for the rain to come. It's like Elijah, you know, when Elijah was in the, in the cave, it says that there was a huge drought in the land that God had brought as punishment to Ahab and all of his mess. And so Elijah goes out and he sees a cloud. I think it was actually his servant. And his servant comes back and says, hey, there's a cloud up there. And he's like, okay, great. The storm is coming. That's the kind of waiting that we're talking about. Here's a looking for, for this justice that is on its way. And then I waited patiently. My second least favorite word in the whole New, in the whole new Oral Testament. It's actually the same combination word, I guess, from what I'm understanding here in the Hebrew. I waited patiently. Apparently, it's the same idea of kava, of waiting, of lingering for, of looking, of longing, of eagerly participating. Amazing, huh? I waited patiently for the Lord. And, and I mean, it, the word there is Yahweh. I mean, it's the existing one, the proper name of the one true God. So, I mean, right off the bat, David is laying it out on the table. He's saying, I, I mean, what a wonderful way to start, right? He's saying, no, not, not, my enemy needs it's not my enemy who needs fixing here it's not my mom it's not my girlfriend it's me who needs to wait i mean that is just so challenging to me are you telling me god that i'm the problem that i'm the one that has to wait for you to do something to act to fix my problems you mean to say that i need to pray and actually as my friends like to say bend my knees and fast and pray about things like come on I never do that. I never want to do that. I've done it maybe once in my life, twice in my 50 years. I don't like fasting and praying. <laughs> Am I a bad pastor or what? I act, I get angry, I move, I shake, I ideate, I, I'm a maker and a shaker or whatever it is, you know, a mover and a shaker. But to wait on the Lord? Come on, David. Like, what are you doing? Did you write this? What, on the last day of school, was this some sort of punishment for, for cheating in class? <laughs> I will wait upon the Lord. I will wait upon the Lord. <laughs> it's like a bad dream. I wait. I, first it's me, David. Wait, kava, linger, look for, gather, patiently. Ugh. What am I waiting for? For the money to come, for to win the lotto? To get my way, nope, for the Lord. And what does the Lord want to do? I don't know, whatever he wants to do. Maybe I'm the problem. Maybe he's going to remove me. Maybe he's going to make me worse, not, not better, right? It's waiting patiently for God to act. 
And here's the beautiful news. What does God do when he smells, when he sees our humility? It says, he inclined to me and heard my cry. Wow. I mean, that really is just so powerful. I could preach on that just like for the rest of my life, just on those, what, 10 words. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. The Hebrew word for incline is the the word nata, primitive word, stretch out, incline, turn, stretch forth, turn aside. It's like someone who's bending, someone who is, it's like a mom who who bends down to pick up her little one-year-old who's crying or who fell. It's like a, a dad who sees a son that is is maybe a, just struck out on the baseball field, and so he runs out to him to say, it's okay, son. You can do it next time. You, you'll catch the next one. I waited patiently for God, and what did he do? He inclined, he heard, it says here, the word heard is shama, another great Hebrew word. He, he obeyed, he listened, he understood. He heard with his ears. He literally heard you. I remember when I was a young kid, I got lost in the store and I was just yelling out for my mom and I'm like, I hope she can hear me. And she did. It's the same thing that God is saying here. I will hear you because what does John 17 say? That he hears the voice of his sheep. He hears your voice. He knows your, your voice. Your mom knows. Isn't it amazing? Like we know exactly what our moms sound like. Vení para acá, David. I remember every time my mom or my grandma would say something, I knew it was them. I knew it was in, I was in trouble just by the tone of their voice. He inclined to me. He heard my cry. And David was crying here. I mean, this is what I love about that ending there again. The word cry there is the word shava. It means to cry for help. It means that David was in trouble. He was lost. He was angry. He was confused. He was in a cave. He, I mean, you know, as usual, he writes most of these psalms when he's running, when he's literally being chased down to be killed by his own family or by Saul or by some other army. I mean, there's always a problem. He writes these psalms mostly out of, out of peril. That's why he says he heard my cry. He didn't hear just his like, you know, traffic is hard or I can't afford my bills or I wonder what's this lump under my arm. I mean, I'm not minimizing any of those things, obviously not the last one especially, but you know what I'm saying? He's, he's in trouble, like his life is in, in, in danger. So don't think that God doesn't care about you or that you can't give him the big things in life. That's what, that's what I often think. I think my problem when it comes to prayer is that I think I can't give God the big things. Oh, I can give him the small things like, I don't know, the Dodgers. <laughs> I don't even pray about that. But I think because of trauma, you know, it's like, okay, where were you, God, when I went through a freaking war? Like, where were you? Like, when I had immigration fears for like 20 freaking years, like, where were you? When I was dealing with all this anxiety, when I, when I was far from my parents for 20 years, like, where were you? I even wrote a song, I remember, in my CD, 2013. You can check it out on iTunes. It's basically called, Where Were You? Or I think the song is called, I've said it all this time, but the best line, at least from my perspective of that song is, where were you? But David says, well, he heard my cry. That's where he was. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. That's what he did. And what did God do? He inclined to me and heard my cry. He cares for me. He cares for you. And then the rest is just really icing on, on, on top of me. It says, he drew me out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry blog, or bog, I'm sorry, or miry clay, as it says in the NIV, and set my feet upon a rock making my steps secure. Who doesn't want security? All of us, right? Don't you want job security? Don't you want health security, peace security, health insurance? Don't you want all kinds of insurance, life insurance? Don't you want to know that your kids will do the right thing? Always marry the perfect man. Drive under the speed limit. <laughs> and then, as if that wasn't enough, 
as if safety wasn't enough, he then made you sing. It says in verse three, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Wow. I mean, David, wow, what a beautiful song. I mean, there's just so much just in those three verses. After he draws us out, and this is not like linear. It all happens at once or it happens. It never happens. It takes forever. But this is the narrative of God's grace. He put a new song in my mouth. So, after he does all this, you know, we wait on God. He comes near to us. He inclines. He picks us up. Like he, like we're like a lost little baby at, at the supermarket at Ralph's or at Big Lots. Not only that, but then he draws you out of the destruction that you're in, out of your cry, out of your mess, out of the mud. And then what does he do? He sets your feet upon a rock. I love that. It's like when I go to the beach. Well, I used to go to the beach. You get sand, you know, all over your feet. And then you have that cool little shower that has a little foot shower. Like it's five inches off the ground. And you just put your foot down there. Oh, it's so awesome. A little spray there on your toes. And then you get rid of all that sand underneath your feet and between your toes. Top, you know how sometimes it gets on like your ankle. If you have like hairy legs. Or if you're dark, you know, it looks like ashes. <laughs> and then you, when it's all clean, then you put your, your flip-flops back on. Oh, it's so good. That's what he says here. He sets your feet upon a rock. In other words, he gets you out of the mess. And then, as if that wasn't enough, he then gives you a pass. He says, hey, here's a brand new iPhone so you can... I made some reservations for you at this nice restaurant. So have some, they have some fish tacos there. So he says, he set my feet up on a rock and then he made my footsteps firm, my steps secure. He like, he hooked you up. It wasn't enough just that he got you out of the mess or that he cleaned you up. It's like the prodigal son. But then he actually paid for your ring and for your new, your new outfit. It's like the other story where Jesus says that the prodigal, no, 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 the Good Samaritan, not only did he did he help this man, but he paid for his hotel. Like he took him to the Holiday Inn and he's like, hey, I'll cover him for two weeks. Just put it on my tab. <laughs> he set my feet upon a rock, made my footsteps firm. No wonder, right? He's like, I'm gonna sing after that. Of course, who wouldn't? Song of praise, many will see and fear. Wow, then there's that, wis that witness, that testimony. When others see the justice of God upon your life, then they're like, wow, God is good. But when they see you make a mess, get mad, get angry, withdraw, run, get given to your addictions, fear, then people are like, yeah, you're just like me. You're just another normal human being. Let's not be normal in terms of giving in to the worst of us, our anger. And I'm always wrestling with giving in to my anger or to my withdrawing. What are you giving in to? Is it worry? Is it perfectionism? Is it fun? Are you giving into your analysis? You want to just make sure everything is perfect and, and safe? Are you giving into wanting to just people please? Are you giving into just saying, ah, forget it all. I'm going to just go and leave and go on a new adventure. Enneagram stuff here. If you're, the, <laughs> if you're into the Enneagram, just going through all of the Enneagram numbers, one through nine. Whatever your vice is to your virtue surrender that to jesus say lord i need you i want to just ask on your behalf pray on our behalf that god would help us all to trust in him to put him first in our lives whatever area you're you're struggling with what in whatever area you're tempted to just take things matter into your own hands i want to encourage you encourage both of us to Wait patiently for the Lord. He's not ignoring you. He will hear your cry. He will lift you up. He will put a brand new pair of shoes and a key to the hospital, to the Holiday Inn or the hospital. And you'll pay your way. He will take care of you. And guess what? He will make you sing like a boy on his birthday. Just he will make you sing. You want to sing with joy? After he delivers you from your current problems? Yes, me too. It's like Goso's song right there. Let's sing a new song. So for me, I just have to trust God, you know. Pray. Wait. Waiting there means prayer. Waiting. You know, look for. I waited patiently, we said. means longing. Looking for. What did Jesus say? Ask. 
and you will find seek knock that's all about prayer i need to pray we need to pray more and fight less lord jesus i pray in jesus name that you help me and help all of us to listen to your voice to wait for your justice patiently long suffering yes three months three years maybe 30 years lord help us to wait in jesus name thank you so much like share comment share this video this podcast with somebody else i'll see you next time adios thank you for listening to the david trigg show find the complete archive at davidtrigg.com or subscribe for free through the podcast app on itunes or stitcher on android Each week, we bring you a message of joy, success, and personal power in spite of fear, anxiety, and depression. Because as we like to say, though there's pain in the night, gozo comes in the morning.